so it's been a busy week. Probably I'm not the only one. I'm, I feel like I'm overworked and underpaid for this job. No paid. No paid, actually. Yeah. Pay is very low. No, the, but the benefits from this job are great, in, in, enormous. So sometimes you get s sort of kind of work benefits, and my benefits are just, just great. It doesn't get a lot better than what I get. Um, yeah, so we've been, uh, it's been an interesting week. I was just, um, I've been going to the work site every day, early morning, opening up the gates. We are moving on the retreat building fairly keep quickly. I don't want to talk too much about that because I'm there on site every day and building work is not very, very inspiring in some ways it is, but some ways it's not. Monks should be talking about Dhamma, monks should be contemplating a Dhamma, and I've been contemplating concrete colors and reinforcements and what carpenters should be doing and what, what, where do we get plumbers and those kind of things. It's not really the monk's job, but somebody has to do it, and I got the opportunity to do good Kamma, and it's a great thing to do something good with the pure heart. You give something for the Buddhist society or you give something for your family or you give something for others. None of us, we are, there's this idea at uh, the self-made man or self-made person and it's, that doesn't exist. We all depend on each other. We all depend on the family and we depend on society around us and we, we depend on each other. We depend on the Dhamma quite often and it's interesting I was the workers, some of the carpenters uh, mentioned the other day that they were wondering how do I manage the stress. Uh, they were surprised that I, because I've been so, literally I've been quite busy and I, it's not just the work side, it's the other office work we have to do. Obviously, I have a great team. I'm not by myself, by all means. We have a very good team and we are coming together um, really nicely as a, as a community. It's nice to see so many of our volunteers now. People are really putting a lot of effort into this and they really picked up nicely when you know something, something went a um, little bit not right with this building project, but it's, it was very uplifting to see that the community come together. A lot of people volunteered to help with this project. It's not, it's not easy by any means. This is a big project. It's almost $7 million we're doing the retreat center. And um, now we are owner builders. And if anybody has been ever be being in a building, you know how difficult it is. And then to being an owner builder for the Buddhist society, it is difficult. So the builders, yeah. So some of the chippies told me that they were wondering how do I manage the stress, and I, I thought about it. And obviously, it's it's the training. I've been very blessed to be in this part of the Buddhist, uh, the Dhamma, part of the Sangha, having met a lot of beautiful teachers. And you, something keeps you above the water line. The water starts getting close to your drowning in, in your life, whether it's your family getting sick or things happening in your life. But if you have your Dhamma, your practice with you, it, it, it keeps you afloat. And it's a, it's a bit of an unfortunate thing, well, unfortunate, but it's the reality of the samsara that really the turning away for us from the samsara, the cycle of, of the birth and death, only one which, which is the eject seed from here is turning away. The suffering causes us to push the eject button until then, it's sort of, hmm, life is okay. It's not too bad until it is. And then you see the suffering, what the Buddha was teaching, you actually see it. And then you start f finding the eject button. You want to get out of the samsara. Samsara is, is in certain ways, it's nice. And there's a, there's a certain happiness here. 
But eventually we realized that we've been repeating this thing too many times. And that's obviously why the Buddha went forth and that's why the Buddha left, left the world behind and took as many people as possible with him. But until then, this path is not really for us to walk alone. So it's another reason why, or another uh, thing I was going to talk today, or actually the main main no, main topic today was. So I, I was talking to the chippies again, the carpenters there the other day, and I said, "Yeah, I'm going to the our city center on Sunday. I'm going to give a talk." And I asked the like the, the carpenters, "What should I talk about?" And I said, "Talk about teamwork." I said, "Okay, well that's a good topic." Because it's nice to, um, as in in a, in the work side, it's a it's a teamwork. For we have a great team now as a as a team of volunteers for us to help with the building side from the Buddhist society. But I also have a great team of people there, and it's it's another thing. It's heartwarming to see that people, uh, a lot of people who come to the work side there in the monastery, they they want to come there because it's a monastery. They want to come there as a as a place. It's not just any old construction site where they go. And people, when they see me as a site, obviously I have my high vis jacket like anybody else, and and my hard boots on. But they still, I, I have my my jack, monk's jacket underneath and my low rope. So they they recognize me as a monk, and so they want to talk about that they are say how they are spiritual people, and they really appreciate working in a countryside and in a monastery. And a lot of people, just the other day, I called a rubbish skip company, and I said where well, I'm calling, and she said, "I want, we want to help you." I said, "What's the? Is there delay fees if we keep it this skip longer?" And I said, "And she, she, she said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of you." So it's been a, it's a nice experience. Obviously, there's an ups and downs. There's uh, some people are just, it's a business as usual, and sometimes business is quite tight, as we all know. But in many ways, you know, we I concentrate on the good good things, and that's a, something I've learned from Majin Brahm. So, but with the teamwork, I was thinking, what are the topics if I if I do talk about the teamwork? So I started to scratch my head a little bit. What what I have I, what have I learned from teamwork from the from the Dhamma from the Buddha's teaching? And if if you put teamwork into the and you try to find from the Buddha's teachings, teamwork doesn't exist in the, as a word there. But working as as a group, there is few interesting stories. So we can find stories. What I've just comes to mind is that there's a beautiful Jataka story. Jataka stories are the stories of the they were told already perhaps time before the time of the Buddha, and they were maybe readjusted for the Buddha's teachings. So there's a nice Jataka stories about flock of birds when they they um these there was this flock of birds and um they were living in this forest and they there was a hunter nearby and it the hunter saw that there were those flock of birds they always flew into this one spot so obviously the hunter wanted to catch them so he cast a net over the uh, the flock of birds and the the those birds they had a leader and the leader was just happened to be outside and was looking down and saw all the you know its mates there on the in the in the net and he said, "All of you, put put your head through the net in, in through the eye of the net and and fly, and if you do it together, you can get out of the net." So that all of the birds put their heads through the nest and they flew into the nearby thorn bush and they landed on that and they they, they left the net there and they flew off. So the uh, the hunter obviously wasn't too happy about this, so it uh, it was waiting. The hunter was looking, and one day he saw the birds are quarreling. The birds were, you know, they were all unhappy with each other. They're quarreling and quarreling and tweeting. You step on my my tail. You, why did you peek my peak? Why is like all the birds are quarreling with each other? They were not happy, and the hunter saw that all oh, the birds are quarreling. So then he cast the net again. And then the, the, the head of the, the birds of the, the flock he said, oh, do it again. Let's put, put your heads through the eye of the net and fly off. 
and then the, the, the birds were so busy arguing, like, you do it, I don't want to do it, I'm sitting here, I did it last time. And they didn't get around doing what they, they, the wise leader was telling them to do. So because of the birds, they were arguing with each other. So the, the hunter came and took the birds away and there was the end of that flock. So that's an interesting Chartaka story. That if, you, if we work together as a family, as a Buddhist society, as a, in a workplace, we can get things done. But if we get caught in this arguing, who did that, or who did what, how should we, you know, like I've done more than you have, we don't get things done. So it's a quite interesting, it's a nice little Chataka story. A lot of them are almost like children's stories, but it, it is something which we can relate to, that sometimes we squabble too much and we don't get things done. Even as a family, we concentrate on the little disagreements. One of the things what I always remember from Ajahn Brahm told us monks quite often that which is more important is, is it to be, to be right or that we have harmony? What's more important? Is harm, harmony should be always more important than being right. It's always more important to be in harmony, to, to have harmony in the family or in the community or in the workplace, than that you are always get your way. There's uh, one of the big things for us monks, monastic sangha actually means we are part of the sangha. Sangha almost means like a group. It means literally like a herd. It, like it, 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 we wouldn't translate it as herd, but it means like group of monastics. But you can su- use the same word sangha actually like herd of deer. That's how they used it. Some, if you read the suttas, you read the Pali, sangha just means a group of something. Like a, they used it, a sangha of deer. So that would be, that's the same word. But for us, we, we use it in a, in a sense that we have the monastic community. So one of the big things for the monastic community, one of the worst offenses we can do as a community is to divide the Sangha. So division, and that's one of the so monastics, we have different levels of offenses. So we have the uh, Parajikas, meaning that the, the, sometimes they call the grave offenses, like you you almost died, you, you, you are dead in the Sangha. So Parajikas are, you commit any of these four Parajikas for monks and you are no longer a monastic. Like if, if I committed today, from that moment onwards, even if I would have my robes on, I would not be a monastic. I'm not considered by any other the mona- any other monastic would not consider me as a monk. Obviously, uh, how it works for us that we have to confess it. So I could just hold my say that I haven't done it, and no nobody really can tell otherwise. Even though they they sort of would keep me out of the sangha, but as long as I don't confess it, it's it's hard to prove anything. That's how it works. Then we have the second class of uh, offenses where we call them heavy offenses. And I don't want to go too technical about this. It's, it's not my, uh, this is not the place to teach about them. But the heavy offenses, one of the offenses for us, the heavy offense is to divide the Sangha, divide our monastic community. It's a really heavy offense to keep arguing as something that the, the community divides. And that what brings me back to this, the topic of working together, teamwork. And there's a famous story of um, Sangha was split at the time of the Buddha. So there was uh, one of some, there was a group of monks who thought there was, they, when there was this offense, that they haven't committed an offense. So they started to arguing. And then the other group said, no, no, don't say that. Uh, that that is actually offense. And the Buddha, this was already a time of the Buddha. The uh, monastics were arguing. They just could not come together and agree on this one topic. And the Buddha went there, please don't argue. It's, it's a really bad thing if the, uh, the Sangha divides. We should not have division in the Sangha. Uh, but the, the monk said, oh, don't worry about it, Buddha, we'll sort it out. You go and meditate, we'll, it's our kamma. It's we have to bear the consequences. We, we deal with this. And the second time the Buddha went, please stop arguing. Just 
um, even if you uh, don't agree with this, you, we still need to just do everything together. And then he said, no, please, Buddha, we, we'll deal with this. And third time, and uh, Buddha tried to uh, uh, um, uh, get them back together, and they said, we will deal with this. And the Buddha said, I cannot um, deal with this, uh, this division, these monks, they don't even listen to me. So what did the Buddha do? He left alone. There was, these are the, we have very few places where the Buddha actually left the Sangha. Sometimes he wanted to go and have a retreat, but in, in this time he said, I cannot, uh, they don't listen to reason. Even the, the monks didn't listen to Buddha. So we cannot really expect that you listen to the reason of monastic these days or anybody really, even if you see monks or n uh, nuns or anybody misbehaving, well, even the time of the Buddha, they weren't listening to reason. So the Buddha left, and there's an interesting story. The Buddha started, the, he went to the forest by himself, and this is an, it's an interesting story. The Buddha went to a forest, and then there's a, he was served by an elephant and a monkey served him food. It's an interesting story. We have very few of those kind of stories. And this almost goes into the Jataka story where the, the, uh, there was a um, monkey brought an, uh, honey to the, to the Buddha. And there's actually in some places in Southeast Asia, Asia there's a, a, a Madhima Purnaka or something it's called. But anyways, it, uh, Madhu means like a honey festival in some Southeast Asian countries. I don't know if Sri Lanka, I know in Cambodia celebrate that. I think Burmese as well. But that's to celebrate that thing where the Buddha was fed actually by the monkey. And there was also, there was an elephant who fed the Buddha at that time. So it's a uh, nice story. I don't know whether it's true, but it's a beautiful story nonetheless. So Buddha stayed by himself in the forest for a while. And then he went to see uh, three monks who were staying by themselves. I think it was Kimbila, Anuruddha, and third monk, which whose name I now forget. Who? Nandia. Okay. And I always thought it was Kimbila, but actually I looked the Bali recently. Actually, it's spelled Kimila. So I think it's Kimila, not Kimbila. Side, side note. Anyway, so he went to see them and he said, you guys live in harmony. How do you do this? You know, you live in harmony. Teamwork. So trying to keep in the topic. So Buddha goes to see these three monks and they said, the three monks, are, they said that when we go to the, that uh, when we go to Pindabha, there is, if somebody doesn't get enough, the others collect and then they, whatever they bring, we share together and we eat from the meals together. Whoever comes first to the monastery or back to the hermitage that was staying, the first one who come, they put the uh, uh, foot washing water, they you know arrange the seats, get everything ready for us to eat meal, and you know get the place together. And whoever you know it's there first, fetches the water, gets to all those things. And if something needs to be done, the, we just do it individually we don't need to you know break the silence we just do live in harmony we do things together and the buddha said that's very important it's a very important to not to start looking that others should be doing certain things in a family uh in a workplace in buddhist society when we're building a retreat center we all just try to that needs to be done i do it so it's a nice story that, that it flows from this idea of working together. So the monks, when they lived in harmony, when they did teamwork, they could practice easily. So what you as a family, how can you practice well at home? Is by making sure that you have harmony at home, making sure you have live in harmony with others. Keeping your precepts, for example, it's been a very, it's a big, almost feels like a superpower to me in all of these things happen to in the work sites and with the previous builder. And I don't have any kind of doubt in my mind that we haven't done the right thing ourselves. I, the, the, the thing is, it's so nice for me, I don't even have to consider that... I don't need to convince anybody in the worksite, we pay you 
uh, we, we you send us an invoice, we pay you. I don't need to sort of convince them because it's just a given. Of course we do. I don't have to go and convince anybody. I don't need to convince anybody, trust me, because I trust myself. I would not lie to anybody. It's a really important thing for us, me as a monastic, but even as a Buddhist, we just have to get into these precepts. When we follow the precepts, there is no doubt in our mind that we are doing a wrong thing. But same with the harmony, teamwork at home. How can you practice your busy life and everything? But at least you should have a place when you come to your home that you know that we care about each other. And when we care each other, we live in harmony. We can just drop these things. I can just go and sit down. I don't have to think about what do the others think of me? How do the others treat me? I can just live at ease. So always value harmony above many things in life. So then uh, uh, the Buddha uh, praised the, uh, the three monks and said, that's great, that's how you should be living because of the, the other group of the monastics, the Sangha, was in our uh, disagreement. They were splitting, that Sangha was splitting, and the Buddha said, um, that's not good. So the, some of the people went to the Buddha and said, well, how do we, they started to hear rumors that the Sangha is, Sangha is arguing. So they asked, how should we deal with this? And the advice was given to them, just don't feed them. Once you start getting hungry, you quite quickly you come to your senses. So the, that's what the lay people did. They stopped feeding the monks. And the Sangha started to notice that people don't pay respect to them and people don't feed us. And you live by yourself for, you know, it doesn't take many days till you start getting your, you know, your, this little argument starts to, you know, doesn't matter so much when you don't get fed. So the Sangha realized that we're not, we're not getting fed because of this thing. So they quickly came to their senses. They went to the, you know, they asked the Buddha to come back, ask forgiveness and said, uh, okay, we, we start meeting together again. And they started to get fed and all that. So there is sometimes you need to have, get back to your senses to realize that teamwork is so important. You, we think as a, as a family that I know this thing better. I can always do things better myself. But we realize that, no, it's more important to do things, uh, sorry, that I can do things by myself better than everybody else. But you just try to get back to your sense and you realize, no, as a family, it's more important to do things together than, than get them right. We are a team here. We are doing things as a team. Family is a team. We all know that as a, when children grow up, if you just leave them on their own devices, they don't pick up things automatically. Children has to be taught by the family and the bigger community. I think quite often I've noticed that in Europe, we have a lot of immigration, same in Australia, but immigration, what happens sometimes with the immigration families, they're lacking a certain kind of support. People, children are not bad on their own, but they are not being taught from the older generations. If they're lacking their grandparents, for example, and the, the family, the mom and dad don't have enough time uh, for them, perhaps, perhaps they don't have that support structure. And then those structures, the society doesn't unfortunately doesn't provide it too well. So for a lot of us, when we realize why did we turn into the person we are now, is we start looking the people around us, our grandparents. They didn't maybe they weren't very strict with it, at least my grandma, grandma parents weren't very strict with me at all, but they provide that security, that kind of softness, that kind of kindness to you, and you hold up to that value. You hold that value. So you realize that kindness and gentleness actually around us makes a massive difference. 
as a growing up, as a child, as a workplace. So I try to, for myself now in the workplace, I try to hold up that thing where things don't have to be done exactly my way, but as long as we work as a team, as a together in the building side now, if people are at ease there, they're willing to listen to me more. So I will, I am been trying to more lean towards that. I see, perhaps I see somebody leaving early and they, you know, we are paying them uh, wages. They should be staying all, all the time there. I, I, you, I cannot concentrate on those kind of things. But as long as I inspire them to do the, the job, they will tell me if there's any problems there. They will tell, tell me how we can fix them and then we work together. So it's a very, very important not to punish anybody because that just makes people hide their problems. If a child comes to you and says, I've done this thing, and if you punish them, what are they going to do next time? Well, they're not going to tell you the problem, the mistake. But if you say, you know, like, sure, I understand that's, you know, it wasn't the smartest thing, that wasn't a wise thing to do, but... Let's try to work together on this one. You try your best of not to make people hide their mistakes. That makes everybody work together. And then we can solve problems. But if we always attack somebody who made a mistake, we just learn to become a person who hides their mistakes. Whereas mistakes, we all know, mistakes are there to be made so we can learn from these mistakes. So never punish anybody who comes to you and says, I made a mistake, I've done this. That's the wrong thing to do in life and in the family and all that. We are trying to always lean towards harmony, working together. It's very important. You don't want to be right all the time. You want to have harmony. So that's the second story of the working together. So it was those three monks and the, the story of the, the monks not working in harmony. So then I thought, what else could there be as a teamwork? And I have for now forget the story, so maybe I should go back. I t actually did notes this time. Let's see. What was the one more? There must be more. Give me a second. Okay. Okay. Well, now I find it. There is such a thing as... Actually, I just talked to the Ajahn Pante Arnavihari about this. There's, uh, there's this uh, story about the Lichavis. Lichavis is one of the uh, groups of people, kingdom, Lichavi kingdom, actually. It was a time of the Buddha in India. Lichavis meaning, it means like a lions. They were the group of lions. They were one of the Aryan groups. Uh, there was a, the Buddha went to the Lichavid and they, they went to talk to the Buddha and sub, sort of short sutta. And then the, the Buddha, because what happened, there were war, wars in the border region there in Lichavi, uh, next to the Lichavis, and there was this another group of people who wanted to take over the kingdom. And the Buddha said, don't go there. The, those people work in harmony. They work as a team there is no way you can attack them. And the Buddha actually went to the Lichavis and he said, I will teach you the seven principles that prevent decline. And they said, okay, what are the seven principles? They didn't, okay, they didn't talk that way, but then they said. And the Buddha said, what are the seven principles that prevent decline as a group, as a team? As long as the Vajis meet frequently and have many meetings. So you come together as a team, you come together, discuss things. They can expect growth, not decline. As long as the Vajis meet in harmony, live in harmony and carry their business in harmony, they can expect growth and not decline. So you come together, you have your meetings as a group, you come the best of your abilities to uh, come in harmony. 
you have those meetings, sometimes you have disagreements, but the important thing is we leave the meetings, the gatherings, we leave them in harmony. So uh, then the Buddha gave a few other things here which are not important and here as a living as a team. But as long as they... Uh, as long as the Vajis honor, respect, esteem, and venerate their shrines, whether they are inner shrines or outer shrines, not neglecting the proper spirit of offering that were given and made in the past, they can expect growth and not decline. I think this is an interesting thing here. The shrines, whether they're inner or outer shrine, I, th I think it's an very nicely said. We have an inner shrine. We, as a Buddhist, we have the shrines of the Buddha, we have the stupas there, we have the things we put offering sometimes for the Buddha. But what's important actually for as Buddhists, we don't really worship deities. We don't expect devas to do so many things for us. We have our inner shrine. We carry the teachings in ourselves. That's a some, something we always have to remember as a Buddhist. We ourselves are the Buddha. We carry it everywhere we go. We carry the Dhamma everywhere we go. We carry the respect. We carry the kindness. Um, we carry the sila, the morality, the spirit amongst us. And that's something we, can, we need to worship, remind ourselves. I carry those things. It becomes like your something you venerate. When you're bowing down to the Buddha statue, you are bowing, in a sense, down towards yourself. That's your inner shrine. And we have the outer shrines as well. But as long as we carry that with us, we can ex expect growth, not decline in our lives. And as a team as well. So that's, a, that's another thing what came to my mind as a teamwork. And I go a little bit back into that story of the, the monks quarreling in Kosambi. The Buddha was trying to get back to the monks together and he was telling this um, the story of he was trying to get the monks back together. And there, he told the story about these two kings who spared each other's lives. And it's a nice story. Uh, when the king, there was another king, he didn't, there was, okay, so I'll, let me try, try to tell the story shortly. There was two kings, and the other king killed this other king's princess, mom and dad. So he harbored a lot of hatred towards this other king. The kings then, uh, he realized that this this um, good person there in his actually, he was, the other king became his training of his elephants. And then he realized that this person is very knowledgeable and he can, he could be a good servant. So he took this other king who didn't know, he didn't know that he killed this other king's mom and dad. But he it was such a well-educated person, a nice person. He took him as, as his personal assistant. And one time they went in, in the middle of the forest they were hunting, and they, then they said, let's take a break there on, an, uh, on the forest. And the other, uh, the other king who had killed this other king's uh, mom and dad fell asleep. And then, then he woke up all of a sudden, and the other king almost killed him. But then he said, look, the, he took his sword and he said, I almost killed you, but I'm going to spare your life if you spare my life. And he said, why were you going to kill me? And then he explained the story, because you killed my, my parents and it was such a horrible thing. And he said, why didn't you kill me? You had the chance. I was sleeping here and you had the, your, um, your sword. This is the story Buddha is telling to the monks. These two kings could come together and not uh, you know, spare their lives. But the, even you as a monk, uh, as a sangha, you're not coming together. But... Um, 
so uh, the story goes like this. Or the, he said, why did you uh, not kill me? And he said, because my father told me this, um, this saying. He says, um, not, uh, not long, not short. And the second, second verse is, for hatred never ends through hatred. Hatred, o- hatred only ends through love. Those were the things his father, this monk, this king's father told the, uh, for his son, and that's why he didn't kill his, uh, his enemy now. And he says, this other king now whose life was spared, he said, why, what does it mean, those things your father said? What's the meaning of which your father told you at the time of his death? When he said not long, he meant don't harbor hate for a long time. When he said, not short, he meant, don't hastily break up with your friends. And when he said, for hatred never ends through hatred, hatred only ends through love, he, were, he was referring to your, to your killing of my mother and father. For if I had killed you, those who wished you well would have killed me, and those who wished me well would have turned and have killed them. In this way, the hatred would never end through hatred. But now you spared my life and I've spared yours. In this way, hatreds end through love. And then this is the story that the uh, uh, Buddha said to the monks. Enough monks, don't quarrel and dispute. But the monks just said, no, we, we deal with our own kamma. So... That's actually a nice Dhamma, it's a Dhammapada verse. You've probably heard that the hatred never ends with hatred. Hatred only ends with love. The, the word there is non-hatred, but quite often we translate it as a, as a love. We still get in arguments, but don't harbor your hatred for a long time. Forgive people. Whatever you have your hatred inside of you, don't make more of it. You see the hatred and you see it as a danger and don't feel bad about leaving it. That's an interesting thing what we sometimes we have hatred inside of ourselves and we feel so bad about it that we, we were angry, we had this hatred that we almost, the guilt lingers that we, were, we, we had anger, we felt disappointed on ourselves. Even those things you have to be able to let go. You need to have mindfulness and meditation in your day-to-day life. When you have hatred, you see that you had it, but don't feel guilty about that. It's an it's really, really difficult thing to do, but you keep working and working on it. And by that, in that way, you become a better person of letting go hatred. But not... Hatred never ends with hatred. Hatred only ends with love. It's one of the principles, what the Buddha was teaching. So the Dhamma has many things it can give us. It can protect us in many ways, whether it's our sila, whether it's working as a harmony, whether it's us having to get rid of hatred. Life tends to throw these curveballs as a, you know, things to us which we never expected. We never expected to our mothers and fathers to turn so fragile and old. We never expected ourselves to lose the control. We never expected for us to having take over the work project. But we need to work with these things because in samsara they will never end. They will be never ending of life giving us hardships. Not in this lifetime or next. We need to practice constantly and that these are the reminders. Don't just get too busy and think, 
when this is over. This will be uh, probably coming to an, to an, towards the end of this talk, but one thing I've learned from Ajahn Brahm early on, he, he used to say this thing quite often about 20 years ago. He always used to tell us, and then what? I get this thing, and then what? I get this thing out of the way, and then what? As long as this just wouldn't be there for me, the bother, and then what? And then what? And then what? I get my sickness over, and then what? No, the practice has to be now. There will be always something else coming. There, there won't be somehow you get rid of this problem, and then it will be fine. Just keep reminding yourself, and then what? And then what? There will be another life, and you still won't end your problems. So that was sort of my talk on teamwork. I'm not sure if I kept in the topic, but I will end there. And sad, sad, sad. Thank you very much, Ajahn, for the wonderful talk. Very timely, even. Um, okay, so we now it's, it's now uh, question and answer time. You shall have the questions on the floor, then followed by online. Helen. Okay, I saw Helen had put up her hand. I'll Thank go you, to sir. Helen. Uh, thank you, Bronte, no first worries. for your talk and yep. particularly for all the work you're doing. I mean, it's quite marvellous to have the situation as a monk, as project mm. manager. A mm -hmm. um, couple of questions. Do yeah. you think your presence there um, changes the behaviour of the tradies and the chippies? Do you think there's sort of less swearing and less sort of bad gossip and all that sort yeah, of I've thing? Yeah, I've told them a couple of times it's coming. I said, no, oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> 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 it, yeah. And my other question was, have any of them shown any interest in the Dharma? Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just yesterday I was leaving the worksite and the, then one of the chippies told me, he's like, yeah, I've, I've read that Dhamma. He said, it, Dhamma. I said, no, it's double M, Dhamma. <laughs> uh, and yes, yes, it's, it is interesting. People, whether, you know, people have spiritual interest, people have it, but there is nowhere... They're either shamed talking about it, they don't have anybody to sort of talk about it, and you don't talk about it in the workplaces, or uh, however it is. Um, absolutely, and they, 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 when they swear, they apologize me for talking in French sometimes. So, but, so I, I don't mind, but the, absolutely, I think it does change, and we, it was a bit of an aggressive side before, and um, I feel now that I, I try to keep it more in the harmony and teamwork and we're doing and hold those values. I think it's a lot nicer place to be. You, you see smiling faces and be, when, when the workplace is um, something you want to be at, you do a better job, better work. So I, I, I realized that and I, I, I think we're doing well and we a lot of mistakes get get fixed when you just attend to it. It's nothing. There's nothing special about it. But you know how many of us we've been in workplace where it's you don't want to go there. In the morning you go towards workplace and you're like I don't want to go there. And I know probably quite a few of us have been in place where you don't want to be in the workplace, but you don't want to go home either. And so it's a really bad place to be that you're going to work, but which you hate. But when you're at the work and you start getting towards the clocking out, you just say, oh, I don't want to be home either. Because your home is not a place you want to be. So we, we need to learn to be as an as a individual and as a group and all that, we, whether we, we have to find a new place or... But somehow we need to work towards the harmony more and more. And the harmony... I think the idea of inner shrine, we have to hold that inside of ourselves, isn't it? That we have the refuge inside of ourselves. You become an island. We work together, but you are the island within yourself. You trust yourself that no matter how difficult it gets, I can, 
I can get through this. And the Dhamma will help us, sure. And I think, I think it's there in many of us. We just give you, somebody gives you opportunity to talk and people want to talk about it, yeah. yeah. This is just a comment one day with what you said. So uh, as a primary school teacher, I could say that the home, the beginning, is the most crucial place to learn living in harmony mm. because that really carries through later in life. Yeah. You know? We always forget sometimes with kids and school yeah. because those traits follow you through to the workplace. Yeah, well, that's it. And I think it's not taught enough. I mean, I, I went to the business school here in uh, the, the department of Monash Uni and I was talking to the head of the department and said you teach business and economics and you don't teach morality. I mean, it's a bit strange thing to teach business but not morality as if just business is business and morality is morality. Uh, they are always together, isn't it? But I think we, uh, it needs to come as a society, we need to you know, realize that those come together. It's not where you, you come to Buddhist society and you teach you learn morality because it's a religious thing. It's not. Hmm. But we always have to remember as in Buddhism, morality is not. It's not. It, it hasn't. The, the ultimate meaning is that you have the morality. You can have a peace of mind. You carry that peace of mind wherever you go. And there's a nice story actually in Dhammapada verse reminds me that's in. Uh, Pihavaka, it's in that where the, the dear ones, a lot of them are, uh, the Pihavaka is the, the, the chapter on, on dear. The last, last verse there is that it's like, like a person who has gone overseas and when they return back home and uh, safely, the family rejoices, they celebrate seeing that person returning. It's the same way when you do when you have your you do good deeds your good deeds welcome you back when you meet them again in the next life i think that's what it says in the verse so your good deeds always welcome you your good actions your kindness will always welcome you rejoice you know it's rejoices you when you you come to that that's how it feels when you've done something good you will always receive it, and that's the, that's the idea. It's a nice chap, nice thing on that, uh, the the verse there that it's like a family who rejoices seeing you. That your your good karma will will always embrace you when you've done it. So never underestimate doing something kind and saying good words. And we we don't do that enough. So we we need to do. We try to remind ourselves that people appreciate. So it's saying something kind you, we all know that it's just sometimes we do shy to compliment each other and say kind things even if they're the you know the, the sort of rough looking chippy from the, from the woods there who's, and you just say something nice and they just really appreciate that but never underestimate doing good things yeah uh, all my questions Yep, we've got one online question. This one from Richard. I compare the life of a monk in a sangha as working in a group uh, in everyday life. Uh, what is it like living in a sangha where one is surrounded by Kalyana Mittas all the time? Yeah, so I think we should all have good friends around us. We should surround ourselves in a good good friends. We the that's a nice thing about living in the monastery that we are surrounded by spiritual people who are we used to talking in certain terms and it supports your own practice so it, it means that it's when you you get the understanding what's important the important importance is there all the time and that's what i'm lacking it's it the, the my spiritual friends are perhaps not when in the work in a building side, the spiritual friends are slightly different spiritual friends. So that that's the nice thing about living in sangha. The, it's just it's a very automatic process living in a monastery because you are surrounded by certain kind of 
people we train well, they, there's nothing special about us as as persons but we are you our training pushes us to behave a certain way to you know we we all we understand we have a certain kind of way of behaving whereas in the, in the workplace that you probably don't have it so it's a lot easier for us to practice in the sense that we i can just leave it behind i don't have to uh think about it too much and i always rem uh, remember that the buddha said the happy mind is actually a peaceful mind so again why do we have why do we have to have a sila so we have calm a happy mind and happy mind leads to a calm mind it's something you can just let go be at ease you don't have to think about it easeness is really un unappreciated value so and if your meditation is not working yet well you don't you don't have enough happiness in your mind that's what really is one of the key things have, just look at your mind what's missing in my happiness what's what's lacking in my happiness in your spiritual happiness if your meditation is not working it's not that you're not trying hard enough it's, there's some kind of inspiration happiness is missing go towards that instead of just pushing 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 and then the meditation will will work so it is it is nice to live in the monastery in that sense with the good friends good thank you uh, any questions from the floor for the above okay. I'm actually taking a, a holiday next week. Somebody says, "Oh, what are you doing Easter?" I said, "You know, there's like, are you going for holiday?" I said, "Yes, <laughs> I'm going to Perth. I'm going to Bodhinyana visit Ajahn Brahm there for a while. So that's good, week and a half." Thank you, Ajahn, yes, for your Dhamma talk. Sure. My question is: sometimes um, hatred is an illness; it mm. prevents peace and healing. And sometimes it's not easy to learn how to forgive. <laughs> and let go <laughs> it's not easy oh no Even i know you try I know. your best you try your best yep yep <laughs> absolutely okay. but then so but i think quite often that the the hatred uh it's really is the hot coal which we don't really want to hold but we don't know what to do with it and sometimes we cannot change the situation. It is what it is. And it's really difficult to carry everywhere you go. But so you you work your way around it. You you realize that it is dangerous. It's not good. Um, the, it's just you... If you carry that hatred everywhere you go, you you cannot have peace of mind. So you, you have to start seeing as like, almost like an entity which you don't want to associate with. I'm, I, I don't want to really carry this everywhere I go. This is really, this is really, really... It's, you know, it leads into all kinds of problems to yourself. It leads to physical problems when you have that hatred inside of you. It can co cause all kinds of things like cancers inside of you or, um, or ailments. Your stomach doesn't work, however it is. You see it and you... When you see it as a really, this is a problem I have, you start learning how to disassociate from that. If you don't see it, uh, if you just, if you live with it and you're not mindfully dealing with it, you you just tend to carry it everywhere you go, and it it's it doesn't really end. You, we try to learn, just learn how to end it as pos as fast as possible, and don't feel shamed about it that's because that's that's another thing we tend to then carry I've, i i shouldn't have felt angry and that rage inside of me you have to be able to let that go as well that even that is something you need to let go hmm. we have in our online questions uh, Lindsay. is there somebody turn it back with the Adrian on the left. Hello, um, my name is Melanie. Um, I would like to ask a question. I was wondering about what type of exercise monks do, because with 
taking up meditation, I found that I was sitting down a lot more mm. and that my body had more trouble eliminating poison, um, which was uh, causing some unpleasantness mm. in and around me. And uh, I was wondering what type of exercise amongst the nuns do because maybe I could also take up Exercising? Yes. Right. Well, I walk a lot, but uh, I think mostly, uh, honestly Sorry. speaking, we don't exercise a lot. Um, and this week I haven't done anything because I've been so busy. But uh, walking, just walking is good. The, thing, the good thing about walking is quite meditative experience. Not looking around sights and this and that, but you just just walk. Just walk. And then after walking for an hour or so, you, your mind tends to calm down. And then it might be easier to sit. Yeah, I, I don't know. Go weightlifting, maybe. <laughs> for me, it wouldn't be good. But um, uh, one of the reasons why we don't really do physical exercise, is a side note slightly, but then you get really aware of your body. And as a monastic, it's, it's, the danger is there because you um you f you you feel yourself you you sort of you get body awareness and you have to be very very careful as a as a monastic with those kind of things but it, for you who knows i don't know yoga walking weightlifting anything just take care of your body it's important yeah no worries uh, any question for yeah next to you that was close. Uh, thank you, Bante, for sharing your talk on teamwork. I've got a question with regards to the team dynamic. Um, mm. What I've noticed is there tends to be a tension between cooperating as well as competing. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily in a toxic way, but there's always this tension that happens. And I guess my question would be, say, for example, you know, say for, uh, say, because resources could be limited, maybe for even attention. I see that in families, I see that in workplace, and I see that in society. So there's always this uh, dichotomy, this tension. And, and I was thinking sometimes, you know, people compete in order to be more successful in obtaining resources, but at the same time, you want to be harmonious, but you, know, you may not necessarily get, you know, to be uh, so-called in a more successful place. Mm. So my question is one, how do you balance it, if you can balance it at all, or do you actually let go of being successful in order to have harmony? And my second question would be, within the realm of, say, the Sangha, is there, do you experience, say, competition as well? A and do you experience this kind of tension as well? And, and how do you resolve it, if you do? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, wh what are we monks competing for? What Did we, we who's the abbot this week or something? I don't know. Like, the good thing about it, we don't have anything to compete. Who gets the most food? Who what, what are we? Who, who got the most robe? Uh, the thing we everything is shared very evenly amongst the sangha. Interesting thing. It's actually in that same sutta I was just reading where the Buddha was trying to get the monks together, and then it said. You know, we all, let's all go on together and live in a monastery. And he says, the Buddha said, um, the, so get the sangta, Sangha together. And nomin uh, then he told, I think, Ananda said, nominate uh, huts for every, you know, all the monks. And he said, never nominate huts uh, in order of seniority. He says, who comes first gets a hut, not by seniority. So even for us, like, we have a certain kind of seniority in the Sangha that we always go how many reigns you've been a monk. So I've been now 12 years, as 12 reigns. People, we always ask among the monks because we sit in a certain order. We go in a certain order of, we go in the uh, pindabad in the arms round. Those are the seniorities. Somebody's in head of me or behind me. So we know where we are, our place is amongst the sangha in that sense. But it doesn't really go any further than that. We the senior monks go first in the in the arms round and they get the food first but even as a, a as lodging we should never 
sort of pull our ranks. I'm more senior. I should get the better HUD. No, if somebody else came first and they, they've been a month for one year, they get nominated. I should never go and ask them to move. Or, you know, it's a, it's a fence for me. And uh, even the monk designating the huts should never consider that. So, th yes, among Sangha, it's a very little. You know, it's not like we live in a harmony all the time either. But we, you know, we disagree and we work with our disagreements. Uh, competing in, in uh, and those kind of things where you see as a group dynamic and this and that. I think I think a lot of problem comes comes from overthinking. We we feel that we we understand this, like how it's working. But I think a lot of times, we overthink. We overthink that what others are doing or what they're thinking or what they meant by that. So try to get into, um, into this kind of habit of not overthinking, not. You know, the harmony comes from you, really. And it, the world, you, you don't end wars, but you will end the war inside of yourself. That's where it should come. So harmony comes from you of not trying to interfere with the world too much. Try to find the, always lean towards finding the best in people. Not looking into this kind of like, is this, which way this is going, this and that. I think... Thinking is over appreciated. You you don't value so your thinking too much. A lot of that thinking is just a waste of time. So mindfulness work it helps with that. You get into this kind of you start saying I'm thinking and thinking and thinking, but this thinking is doesn't it's there's no actual uh, meaning or it's not really. You're just making up stories. A lot of the world is we making up stories. So try to uh, not value that too much. Don't trust yourself too much. That's it. One very quick last question um, that came through because Adrian gave us a bit of a teaser that you had some good news. What's Ajahn the good news? was mentioned, Adrian said, oh, Ajahn will announce some good news. Well, that was the good news, that we building side is working. It's going well. A couple of months, we have a, at least the cottages are done. And then good news is I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, in my... <laughs> everybody's... Uh, the, so I'm going... Yeah, so it, really the good news is that we are honor builders. We, it, we're working really hard and uh, we have a good team working together. And the good news is that we are really moving ahead with the building project and then a couple months the cottages I've this time I'm I'm fairly sure that the cottages will be done soon and we even have a uh, we find a good builder for their main hall so that's moving ahead so hopefully we have a beautiful retreat center coming soon and hopefully Ajahn Mudito can take a break and go in the forest thank you Ajahn that's the good news thank you so much I see you out there so good yes thank you Thank you, Ajahn. Um, just a quick short uh, thing. There will be a Thai New Year and, uh, and a Sri Lankan New Year coming up in April the 14th, I believe. So we will be having a cultural feast here on that day. So please uh, bring your special specialities from your own uh, When is it again? Of, eh? When is it again? Sorry? April the 14th. April 14th. So it's three weeks away? Yeah, three weeks away. So... Um, Bring your own cultural special uh, food on the f April the 14th, and we shall have a very good New Year celebration. New Thai New Year and Sri Lankan New Year on the well, April 14th. Thank you. Uh, please join us for lunch next door. Thank you, Ajahn. No way. Thank you, Adrian. That was good. Yeah, and uh, Ajahn and uh, the, the sub building subcommittee team has been working very hard. Last month, we were feel very, very down with with what's happened with the project, but uh, we are so uplifted now, and that's good news. Mm. We are uplifted uh, with the, the progress, that we had a good start with the project, and everything is getting into place now. Sadhu, sadhu to uh, Ajahn and the, uh, team. the team. Thanks. Thank you. So good, sadhu. Can we do respect? Yeah, okay. Let's pay respect. Very good. Okay, we just bowed three times to the book. <laughs>